Get ready. Get ready. It's time for the Medicare Funcast. Medicare information for those that need it. Music, memories, interviews, and pop culture for those that don't. And now, here's Brian Coolis. Welcome to the Medicare Funcast. Make sure you check out the Medicare Funcast on YouTube and my podcast on Spotify, iHeart, and wherever you get your podcast. Search for the Medicare Funcast. I have a special guest with me today. If you grew up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in the 80s and 90s, his name and four letters were magical to your ears. K-V-I-L. Once you hear his voice, you'll know who I'm talking about. Outside of Texas, you may recognize him from his various media appearances. I personally had the sincere pleasure of working with him at KVIL Radio. What do KVIL, Ron Chapman, Bass Reeves, Ranch Rub, and the Texas Broadcasting Hall of Fame have in common? It could only mean one person. It must be the legendary Jody Dean. How you doing? Doing well, sir. How are you today? Well, it's so good to see you. It's been a long, long time. I, I, I worked with you back in the 80s and 90s at KVIL. Uh, you, you put my beard to shame. I mean, look at your beard, Joey. <laughs> well, I, I can't bring you this for sure. You know, it, it, John Glenn used to say that if it, a man wants to waste his hormones growing, a bit, uh, growing hair, that's up to him. Uh, but, you know, uh, I'm certainly not as virile, virile as John Glenn, but uh, it saves spirit gum. I don't have to spend money on spirit gum. And uh, are, are you? Did you take like some uh, ZZ Top Billy Gibbons injections, like hormone injections? You know, you... it's funny because uh, years ago when I was still at Kayla, we did a promotion at the old Hard Rock Cafe, mm-hmm. and it was a karaoke thing. And it was when that was huge, and I think we call it KD, Kayla Idol or something like that. Okay. And, uh, each one of the staff members had to get up on stage, and we had to lip sync to our favorite songs. Well, I did Sharp Dressed Man. And I had nice. the full on, I didn't have this much beard that I had kind of like it, but I put a mustache over it and then a full beard that came down to here and I had a black duster and, uh, you know, the ZZ Top uh, gimme cap that had the braid across the top. Written Absolutely, the yes. Right? And so I'm waiting to go on and I'm out standing, I was so hot, it was so hot inside that club that night. And I'm standing out on the top of the fire escape. Well, you know, right there in that part of uptown, right across the street, there are nightclubs and everything. People are walking down the street. They look up and they see me. Now, I'm way bigger than Billy. Billy's a very slender man. He's in shape. Right. I'm not. I'm a very large human being. But in the dark, with, you know, only the street lights, a lot of people, whoa, you know, like wow, that. There it is. That's a lot of fun. And, and did you have a guitar and everything with you? And all, and all that? I did. did I did. I bought a cheap guitar at Walmart and covered it with fuzz. I got some, <laughs> of the, you know, right. some stuff from the fabric store. It was purple or something. And I made it look like the, you know, eh, I don't know how to stop, you know, that sort of thing. And I made it look real. I, oh, yeah, that's, that's, awesome. the, that's the thing about whenever I do anything, uh, whether it's radio or television or uh, theater or stage or whatever I'm doing, um, even if it's decorating for Halloween, uh, you know, just for the kids in the neighborhood or Easter or whatever, I got to make it look real. Because if I don't make it look real, then it's, you know, I'm a perfectionist. I'll grind my teeth over it, and that's no fun. So it's got to look right. And I was talking to you a little bit yesterday, Jody, and uh, there was some reason that, were you kind of walking funny yesterday? What, what, what happened? What? What? what, what? You, you, you're, you're, you're in pain. You said you were oh, having yeah. trouble walking. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. If, if you uh, grew up riding a horse, and you think you know what you're doing, but you haven't been on one in several years, I mean, other than maybe for a trail ride, that ain't good enough. And so when you get back on one and start working with a horse, a, a performer, um, and that horse knows what to do, and you're doing English, and I have no idea about English riding. I know how to walk. I can get by riding Western. Uh, so, yeah, I was working in an English saddle, doing dressage, and all of that sort of thing, and learning an entirely new vocabulary. Um, and yeah, man, it was the, the, the horse master, the master of horses, um, was instructing me and, you know, telling me, okay, you want to lean this way. And it's kind of like riding a motorcycle. You know, you look where you're turning and that sort of thing. Sure. Don't right. ever look straight in front of the bike. You do that when you're turning, uh, riding a horse is a lot like that, especially in, you know, this kind of riding. And, uh, I was working out muscles. I forgot I had and boy I mean I, after about two hours of that I just looked at that guy and said mercy 
you know, because the ball jacket of my uh, ball socket of my left hip was beginning to go. Nope, you're not 24 anymore. You know, so absolutely. Uh, yeah, I was kind of sore after that whole thing. And uh, definitely, everybody's going to want to know about KVIL. We'll kind of circle back to that, Jody. Uh, you know, everybody knows you in the DFW area. For my uh, viewers outside of the uh, DFW area, we'll kind of fill in things and, and kind of uh, explain what you were about, Jody, and, and kind of go back on your career. Oh. And, uh, I was I was digging around and I saw that uh, I didn't know this at thirteen year old thirteen years old. You did a TV show called Museum of Horrors. What what was that about? Oh, Thirteen I, years old. Oh, I know, so much fun. Um, I mean, I was already <laughs> a fan. My mom, my adopted mom, sang in the opera, and so okay. she, she sang for the you know the women's club, the Utopians, all that sort of thing. And so whenever she'd perform, I'd go. And I think she kind of wanted me to be her. You know, she was kind of a Mama Rose character, right? So I was no Gypsy Rose Lee, but she kind of saw a future for that uh, in that for me. And I loved it, you know, whether it was playing a Billy Goat Gruff or anything like that. And as I grew up, I really, really, really enjoyed those old universal horror films. Uh, the one star, oh, Carlos, and, you know, all the, the old black and white ones. And so when I was about 13 years old, I got my first job. I was working as a stock boy in um, Billy Bear Sporting Goods, which was on Vickery Street in Fort Worth. Well, yes. Bill had a son named Wade. And Wade was just out of college or senior at that point. I can't remember. It was very young. And he had a friend that he'd gone to high school with named Greg Branson. And Greg was a big fan of those old monster movies, too. So mm -hmm. uh, they would put on haunted houses for our church. Now, imagine that. Imagine a church doing a truly spooky haunted house now. That just doesn't happen uh, anymore. That doesn't for reason. Yeah. And so, but we did, man. We had Mad Danny the Ghoul. We had the Creature of the Black Lagoon. We had the mm -hmm. Monkey Frankenstein, blah, 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 blah. And so, you know, I just, oh, are you kidding me? We get to dress up and have fun, and, you know, that's crazy. And so here I was playing high school football and later a little college football, and at the same time, I had this real theater kid mentality. And so I started getting the drama when I was in sixth grade, seventh grade. By sure. eighth grade, I was working in that sporting goods store, and Greg wanted to start a TV show. And he found a spot late Saturday nights after, after the 10 o'clock news, and he called it the Museum of Horrors. And I just, you know, what can I do? You know, I didn't get paid uh, well much. I, every once in a while, he'd slip you some cash. You know, and we do some live sure. shows and that sort of thing. But it was kind of a Uncle Creepy, Vampira, uh, Mistress of the Dark, Elvira sort of thing. You know, we'd introduce the movie and then come out between the commercials in the film. And they were terrible. But, but, but you didn't dress like Elvira, right? No, 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 no. I was the... I was the <laughs> perfect fit for the creature role because I was, you, you know, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, in those days and, you know, played football, so I had some size and, um, and it was distributed better and, uh, you know, the idea of putting those boots on and it was so much fun because I learned a lot of things. Um, number one, you know, when you see a film like uh, the Boris Karloff version of that, we would do live shows and we would do theater openings. We opened... Um, Young Frankenstein at the Ridgely Theater in Fort Worth. Oh, it's okay. premiere. We were there yeah. out front. Yeah. Right? And so all these little five, six, seven-year-old kids would come running to me. And I realized, you know, especially young teenagers like 10, 12, 14, you know, 16, yes. you know, you'd scare the kids, of course, like that, but they'd want to come hold your hand and take a picture. And it dawned on me as I watched those films that they identified with the creature, that they saw an awkward kind of lost figure that really didn't know its purpose in the world and he wasn't very good around people and so it, it it hit me that there was much more depth to these characters than i ever realized you know why do people like that what is it yes. they see in that yes and that was a big thing with those old universal studios films because like the wolfman he was a man bearing a curse and uh, the, you know the launch i like to tell people if you watch the original boris karloff frankenstein uh the creature is not the monster. The people are the monster. His creator is the monster. That's, that's right. He is, he's he's yeah, really he is. misunderstood. And yeah, there's, he's a, creator, there's a scene creator, where he's thing. with the little girl and the daisy, right? The oh, yeah. Flower. Oh, and they, you know, they edited that terribly and made it look horrible when it first came out. And restored footage shows that he was just, okay, if the flowers float, so does she. And then all of a sudden, to his horror, oh, my God, yes. it didn't float. 
And it was a very sympathetic character. And I started nice. seeing those things that way. And so, you know, and we had the funniest story about that. We did it for about two years. And of course, my friends would sit at their houses and, hey, there's Dean, right? And um, I apologize, my voice. I've been reading lines today. We had a table read. And um, so they sit at watch, and we got a call one day, and the program director of the station wanted to meet us. This is 1975. And he said, well, we're going to move you to Saturday day instead of Saturday night. Who wants to watch a horror movie in the middle of the day? Uh, but we've got a new show the network wants to run, and we don't think it's going to last very long. But you'll probably be back in the regular schedule on Saturday night after the 10 o'clock news you know, in a couple of weeks. Sure. Well, that show, you've already, you're ahead of me, that show was Saturday Night Live. Ah. So I have the distinction, my first job in broadcasting, I got canceled by Saturday Night Live. Now, I don't know how many people can say that. So that was my introduction to show business, and I was hooked. That's great. And uh, were you actually like the class clown, or were you, were you more shy? Or were you like the no, class clown in, in school? No, I was awkward. I was terribly awkward, and you know, for a lot of different reasons, um, it was a deep, it was a deep thing. Um, I, of course, like any other teenage boy, I loved attention, and I hung out with some great guys. We're still friends, you know. It's been forever, and uh, I've never had a better group. Well, I've worked some, with some pretty special people and gotten to know some really deep connections over my career but as far as my buddies those guys are still my buddies we have a that's right a text chain there's about 22 of us in the bunch starting offense and starting defense for pascal and uh so yeah we stay together so but i was also the theater kid and you know i found a lot of expression um uh, i grew up in a household with a lot of illness a lot of death uh, right. my mom and pop my adopted parents lost five children and all my sister died when i was mm -hmm. six when she was 12. And I think at some point up until Susan died, I kind of wanted attention. And so, you know, being, you know, a football player or, you know, being a, a kid in the play, it kind of forced people to watch. And so I think that's part of the reason that I got into it. I, it wasn't that I liked the sound of my own voice. I hate the sound of my own voice, which is why I learned to do different voices. But... Sitting through an air check session. Oh my God, that was, you know, that was like the same. Oh, that, I always hated that. It's brutal. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's oh I hated it. I hated it because I couldn't, I thought I stuck. And, but when other people thought I could do it, boy, that was, you know, gas in the tank. And it didn't take much. Um, my, one of my best friend's dad, uh, Ted Norman, who was a pioneer in broadcasting, sang an orchestra, sang in New York. Came back here, sang for WBAP, eventually got to station management. He was a genius, genius of a man. He created KSCS, which is Silver Country Stereo, the big sure. FM country station here. It's been around forever. He created that. Well, he wrote a letter to the college where I went to school, and he basically said, you need this guy. And when a guy like Ted Norman, who flew B-17 missions during World War II, before he ever got into that business, uh, writes you a letter like that, yeah, you can go a long way. You can go many miles on stuff. And then I did. The greatest generation. I love them. Yeah. I knew a lot of those people and I worked with them too. And, you know, I look back. That's always been the craziest thing. When I look back at the list of names of people that I've worked with through no, yes. through no responsibility of my own, you know, who gets to work with Dan Rather? Who gets to work with Ron Chapman? Who gets to work with Dick Clark? Sure. Yes. You know, I've been to, I've been able to work with these people, and I look back and I go, well, I mean, you name the country artist or rock and roll artist, I've probably been on stage with them at some time. And, uh, you know, you, you stand backstage and you watch Roy Orbison required by the audience to sing four encores of just the chorus of crying. Mm, mm, amazing. You see how people uh, do their stuff and you think, okay, I don't right. know how or why, but thank you, God, right? Now, you uh, you also worked at Billy Bob's Texas, right, as a DJ and rodeo announcer? When we opened that place, we were loading in the tables the day that President Reagan was shot. Oh, my. And awesome. we did not know if there would be a crowd for that first mm -hmm. weekend, right? And we fire-coated the first night. You know, people wanted to get out and take a breath after that horrible thing. So, um, yeah, our, our DJ booth at the time was a folding table on the corner of the dance floor. And it was terrifying because I would have the Orange Blossom special play and some couple would come by doing the swing and you just prayed they didn't hit that table. 
Eventually, we moved it, ironically, into an old Methodist pulpit that I think belonged to Spencer Taylor's dad. He was one of the co-founders of the club. Right. And, you know, you get to work with Conway Twitty and Chuck Berry and Bob Hope and Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson. And, you know, we were there on a Thursday night. The, the official record says it was a weekend, but George Strait came in on a Thursday night before he'd hit with Amarillo by morning. Sure. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew who he was. We had the Rolling Stones come in on Halloween night in 1981 or 82 i can't remember it's 81 i think they just played the cotton bowl in a driving rain and oh, yes i went to that went to that yeah. concert yeah absolutely. and they played the next day it was a beautiful november 1st right it's gorgeous well after their show on the, on halloween they put on some of those cheap masks you could get at five and dime and they came in the club nobody knew, knew it was there. oh that's hilarious wow uh, how do you i mean tell me tell me another life i could have chosen where i could have witnessed things like that Absolutely. And uh, one night in March of 1981, uh, a certain Ron Chapman uh, walks into Billy Bob's. Tell us about that. He and our wonderful afternoon drive host at the time, Larry Dixon, they had right. come over to see the club before it opened. They wanted to see what everybody was talking about. And so they came into the rodeo arena, the bull riding arena. And I hadn't yet signed on to the, be the rodeo announcer. They kind of talked about it. I was still just the DJ. I'd come from a club called Spencer's Palace which was owned yes. by investors and Billy Bob's. And That's so they nice. moved me over, which I really wanted to do. But, you know, rodeo, I'd kind of done that, you know, some small town things like that. But, you know, these are tourists coming all from all over the world. It's very tight show. And so I'm in there helping hoist the speakers. They had a big center speaker stack right in the middle of the arena. And Ron and Larry came in. And I had already sent Ron a couple of air checks from... KLIF, KXOL, and I sucked. I was so bad. And, but he he heard something eventually. But I walked over to him, and I had this fringe jacket. My beard and my hair were black. I had on a black hat. The only thing missing from this Hank Williams Jr. ensemble were the shades. And I walked over, and I had on riding wheels, so I'm this much taller than I ordinarily would be. And I put my big you know meat hook on his shoulder. He turned around, and I said, I will come work for you. My exact word. And he said, aha, you know, like he's never heard this before. And uh, he said, come by the station one day and watch my show. And I said, I'll be there at three in the morning. And I drove straight from Billy Bob's after we finished with those speakers, about one or two. Yes. And I drove and I parked in the parking lot and waited until he showed up at the Capitol Bank building. And I saw my first show. I didn't change clothes, didn't go home. You know, I just, I was there. And I guess that impressed him at some point because it was like, this guy really wants to be here. And I didn't care what they had for me. It was like, that was my dream. I knew what they did was the right way to do it. I could hear it. And it was impressive. They put the listener first. They never talked about the audience. They talked about the listener. On your first yeah. night there, they would show us a picture of Nancy Lundquist, who was Vern's Lund Vern Lundquist's wife. And prior, prior to that, I think she'd been a Kim Dawson model. And she was an attractive woman. And, you know, Ron would hold up a picture and say, she's, you know, 25 to 54. She's professional. She has her own life. She has her own standards. She probably has two children. She has a divorce. She's on her own. And you will treat her like the lady that she is. That was our coaching. That was our education. Number one, that was so target specific that you had a mission you knew exactly what you were supposed to do and how how would you talk to that woman what would you say to her how would you identify with her day getting up in the morning putting on those fuzzy slippers walk into the window seeing if the world right. is still there a cup of coffee maybe before the kids get up a few minutes of your own you know all of that sort of thing and they thought about that and the other thing was you want me to play records for women okay you know i mean as a dj who worked in the nightclubs i realized really quick it wasn't the dudes who came up wanting to hear a song if you wanted to get noticed if you wanted people to pay attention play the songs the girls like and that's what we did and Absolutely. you know i are you kidding me it was awesome you know and, the, and the, our listeners were amazing people i mean we did some crazy stuff and they were always there for us and they always believed in us and finally, we let them down. I mean, radio became something different, and it became less listener-focused and more profit-focused. And once that happened, it was only a matter of time. But in those days, it was Camelot. 
Now, for those living outside of the area, Jody, uh, kind of explain some more. What was the phenomenon known as KVIL? Well, it was kind of the same as Southwest Airlines when it first started out. Southwest Airlines um, referred to itself as the little airline that could. The airline that love built, right? Love Field. Right. And so it was that kind of creativity and, and, the, and the ingenuity and brilliance of people like Jim Hilliard and Reg Johns and George Johns and Ron, uh, of course, Ron. Um, but all those people just kind of fell in like tumblers in a lock. Yes. And they, they got it. We did a promotion once. We actually did it for three years called the KVIL Auto Show. And the idea was if you put our bumper sticker on and people said, oh, nobody's going to do that. If you put our bumper sticker on and we have your license plate and read it on the air, you yes. win one of three prizes, either your next car payment or sometimes all your next car payments or a new car. Absolutely. And we gave away a new car. Imagine radio doing this now. We gave away a new car every week for 10 weeks. One time I gave away a six pack of Chevrolets. Six in one day. One day. The reason that worked was because Jim Hilliard took a look at the very first KVIL auto sticker. We didn't call them bumper stickers. We, we didn't want to tell where people where to put it. One of our rules was never tell the audience what to do. Okay? Tell them what there is to do and let, up, let them make the, up their own minds. That's an old, you know, journalistic standard. Don't tell them what to think. Just tell them what happened and let them make their decisions. Yes, and so Jim absolutely. looked at that bumper sticker, and it had it was KBIL. It was all the result there. And, and Jim looked at it, he goes, where's the warmth? And that was the birth of the heart. I heart KBIL. I, oh, yeah. You absolutely. know, KBIL hearts me. And it was about the same time as the New York bumper stickers. There it is. KBIL hearts yeah. Texas. Then the, I think the last one we did was KBIL hearts the American flag. I mean, we played that thing out. Absolutely, it was yes, crazy. Yes. One year we gave a listener um, a new car every year for the rest of her life. Her name was Sandy Taylor of Weatherford, Texas. And I think it was 25 years later that the company that bought the company that bought the company that bought KVIL bought her out of that lease. And that's all it was. It was a lease. But nobody knew about leases then, really. That's not how we sold it. What we said on the air was not we're, we're going to lease you a, a car and you get a new one for as long as you want. We said, you get to pick a new car every year for the rest of there. your life. We you go, yeah. sold that and, stuff. Yeah. And Jody, I, I, was, I was blessed to have, have worked there in the 80s and, and 90s right after I graduated the University of North Texas. Yeah, and, and you were always great to me, Jody, and everybody, but like you said, working around these legends, I mean, my goodness, this was uh, this was number one radio, it was, it was big time radio. Of course, Jody, you remember the prize catalog, I mean, the oh, prize catalog, people went crazy over that. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, there was the KVIL and the fantasy line on top, so it was L. I V K fantasy, right? And the mm -hmm. prizes at the bottom were like $250 each. And there were 30 different ones to pick from. If we called out your number, you have a choice from the L line or the V line or the, well, when you got up to the fantasy line, the fantasy line was <coughs> a trip to Osaka aboard the Concord or something great, uh, a private, a personal yeah. submarine. Uh, yes. We had his and hers Mercedes. Or actually, what we did, we were so, I mean, this was Chapman. Ron Chapman would say, no, no, no. We have hers and his Mercedes. Yes. Yes. And like 50 prizes or 25 prizes at the top that were $50,000 in value. Um, but it wasn't just that. It was, I mean, yeah, those were huge. We gave away houses. We gave away boats. We gave away trips around the world. We did all of that stuff. We sent people behind the Iron Curtain on the Great Race before the Great Race was ever on TV. We did right. it twice. Right. Twice. Amazing. 25 years before CBS ever thought of it. Ever thought of it. And why did we do it? Because at the first one, Braniff wanted to promote its destinations around the world. The second one, American Airlines wanted to promote their destination. Um, you know, we, we sent people around the world before the Great Race was ever conceived. And... Uh, 
but it all began with things like one day when um, Kroger called us. I think it was Kroger. No, it was Chiquita Banana, and they had a semi tractor trailer full of unwanted bananas. That, I guess somebody had ordered too many or something, and they asked us, like, what would you do with these? Can you use them? I mean, they called us, a radio station, said, could you use these? And so Jack Shell, who has an IQ and triple vision, uh, looked yeah, at and said, yeah. yeah, you know Jack. I mean, he said, why don't we create something called Banana Sunday? And, and this is when KVIL was in the uh, top floor of the Park City's Capital or uh, Park City's Bank Building in uh, Park City, uh, yeah, yeah. in Highland Park Village. You know, KBIL FM Highland Park. That was the, the, fam the famous uh, triangle building. Right. right? right. Yeah. No, no, that was the KLIF building downtown. Dallas. KLIF. Okay. You know, this was in the, this was in Highland Park. I mean, this was like our studios were in Beverly Hills. You know. Yes. yes. And so we looked out over the Dallas Country Club. I, I mean, golf balls would hit off our control room window. And so what we did is we parked that big semi out there and talked about it on the radio for a few days. And the line was all the way down Preston Road into Oaklawn and to downtown, which is probably three, four miles away. Oh, wow. wow. And, you know, I mean, what do you do with an extra load of bananas? We thought of something. And that's why we won. That's why we build $24 million annually. That's why our 2554 female numbers were somewhere north of 25%. That doesn't happen anymore. I mean, I mean, KBIL had our own news helicopter. You had uh, the rolling stereo studio. Oh, my complete, God, the big studio. Complete studio, yeah. We, we could take you, Jody, the morning show, uh, like the auto show or anywhere in Dallas and, and do, a, do a live show anywhere. It was amazing. We did one. We got into the habit of doing these Labor Day shows because we were going to do a 4th of July fireworks show, and it got rained out one year. So we postponed it and made it Labor Day. So that became the end of summer party. And we used to do it in the Trinity River Bottoms. Uh, we would set up a stage and people would sit on the levee. And we had Restless Heart. We had Ray Wally Hubbard. We had all kinds yes. of people down there. And so one year, Ron had gone to um, the Kentucky Derby. And they have a big brunch, you know, the mint julep brunch, right? And so they had this big brunch. And before dawn, fireworks or at dawn. And Ron went, nobody's doing that. And so he came back and he said, why don't we find a place where we can do morning fireworks? Well, uh, obviously it's going to have to be someplace outside the city. So we found this little place just west of US 75 Central Expressway in McKinney on Virginia. And there was one building on it at the time, and it was the visitor center for Stonebridge Ranch. Oh, my. Wow. Yeah. And on Labor Day morning, 80,000 people got up, put on their pajamas and fuzzy slippers, packed up the kids and came out to watch the Dallas Wind Symphony get a free Owens Country sausage biscuit and watch morning fireworks. 80,000 people. We had the Rolling Stereo Studio out there on a little hill. And if you look back down Virginia, it went all the way. It looked like the, light, the headlights in Field of Dreams. That's crazy. It that was. That they'll come. <laughs> if you want to do that, they will come. Know? And that was always the challenge is we would always have to think, okay, we've got to do something bigger. And and after a time, you know, when you had four newspapers in town and 18 department stores and <laughs> everybody is uh, advertising and spending money. But part of the, you know, the thing that I noticed is that there became a noticeable lack of creativity among the sales force over time, not ours necessarily. But when I left, you know, by the time I left uh, KRLD and went back into uh, music radio at K-Love, yes. mm -hmm. um, I noticed as I would drive on the major thoroughfares in town that most of our advertisers seemed to be along certain highways. I didn't see many of our advertisers at all in Fort Worth after, let's say, about 1991, 92. I mean, right. some were on, but... It seemed like there were vast untapped markets that people would just get off the road, you know. And then, you know, of course, what they did later, uh, corporate radio decided, well, we're just going to, we're not going to pay you a salary anymore. We're just going to pay you straight commission. And, you know, what happens when you do that, most of your sales force is going to be very young. They don't, you know, there's no security to stick around for, like when we were at sure. KBIL. That's I right. mean, nobody left KBIL. Nobody oh, left. We had a they were making big bucks. Yeah. Oh, we, we had a portrait in the lobby of the million dollar sales club, and there were ten people in the portrait. Sure, absolutely. That doesn't 
happen anymore. And the reason it doesn't happen is not because there aren't quality people out there. It's because corporate radio doesn't know how to keep it, attract and keep them. Now, uh, Jody, uh, refresh my memory on this. Uh, Did Ron Ron and you in the morning show, uh, Ron just announced uh, with no explanation for everyone to send in a dollar? If you go to my SoundCloud page, you will find the promo that ran that day. He oh, was actually right. testing. Mm-hmm. He was testing the idea of credibility and trust, because yes. what was happening in the news at that time was Jimmy Swagger, Jim Baker, Oral mm-hmm. Rock, all of, right, and Bob Tilton. Tilton, right, <laughs> right. And so, would people send for no reason other than being asked? Would they send twenty dollars checks? And so he created a promo, and he he, he just said, "I have a special announcement coming up at seven twenty this morning." Didn't tell me what it was. Didn't tell anybody, but the lawyers in, in the company he asked, "Can I do this?" And it turned out the rules are that if you don't tell people what you're going to spend it on, you don't have to spend it on, you can spend it on whatever. If you give them a specific target, we're going to spend this money on this, Mm -hmm. and then you violate that, then you've got a problem. But if you just say, I need money, send me money, and you don't really tell them this is going to this and that's going to that, all bets are off. And so, you know, he said, I'll never read the promo. I was in on the phone, and of course, phones were ringing all the time. I had to answer every call because most important person at any business is the one who answers the phone, right? That was a big KVIL rule. The press always gets through, you know, things like that. God help yeah, you right. for a reporter trying to call a radio station. Now you got to go to corporate, and, you know, just forget right, it. You can't right. get anybody. Try to call an AE, you can't get anybody. So uh, the announcement started, go to your checkbook, write a check for $20, no more, no less, just $20, and send it to KVIL Radio 75206. Please do not send more than $20, $20 only in a check, no cash, yes. to KVIL Radio 75206. <laughs> Thank you. Da, 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 da. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I did this. I literally, this is no joke. I went, because I went, what have you just done? Two days later, the, the people from the newspaper came over and took a picture of me in a pile of mail up to here. By the time that was done, we collected somewhere in the neighborhood of $260,000. We had to tell people to stop. Um, we put it to a vote. If you want your money back, but if you don't, here's we really didn't think this through. But here's where yes, we're gonna yes. so went to the Carpe Collins Center at the Salvation Army, went to buy a new refrigerated truck for the North Texas Food Bank. It went to the Dallas SPCA because we had a staff member who passed away earlier named Sandy Hopkins and she loved animals. So we did it, we created a library at the SPCA for people who wanted to learn about adoption and rescue. Um and we you know, we bought a van for the women's center. Uh, to help, you know, a battered and abused women get out of those situations and get to shelter. So, um, you know, that's where the money went. And out of all those people that sent twenty dollar checks, I think maybe thirty asked for them back. Thirty. That's that's a great percentage. Isn't that crazy? I mean, it's insane. Mm -hmm. It's insane. And they did it because they trusted Ron. And you know, that was that was that kind of went back to the old thing about tell them you're gonna do something, the the first rule of promotions. Tell them you're going to do something, do it, tell them you did it. And if at any point any one of those things is violated, mm-hmm. then you fracture that trust with your listener. And boy, God help you if you did that, because you would not last long at that station. We didn't let many people go, but some of them went, went rather um, violently. <laughs> Violent. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to music, memories, pop culture, and more on the Medicare Funcast. I want to thank Red River Auto Group for being a sponsor of the Medicare Funcast, Mitch Ward and company here in Central Arkansas, uh, doing a great job. They have a great selection of vehicles. They will deliver anywhere in the continental USA, make it really easy on you. Mitch Ward and company are great. Give them a call at 501-381-7807, or their website is redriverauto.com. And of course, with any questions on Medicare, you can call or email me. My company is Affordable Health and Life, 
501-307-1396. You can email me at medicarefuncast at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. We now return to the Medicare Funcast with Brian Coolis. Now, uh, that's a great, great story, Jody. Any other crazy, insane stories you remember working with Ron or any of the staff at KBIO? Any, any weird, crazy things happened? Well, you know, it, Ron was a very tough person to work for. Not everybody, not everybody liked him. Not everybody enjoyed it. Some people have never forgiven him. You couldn't do now what we did then. It, it was right. just different. It was just different. And you could not talk to people the way... Uh, you cannot do that now. You just can't. It was like playing for Vince Lombardi. And Vince Lombardi was a great coach in his era. And Ron lasted much longer than a lot of people thought he would because Ron was very adaptable. He loved to learn. New things excited him. The new right. day excited him. And finally, at the end of his career, he just went home to his wife, Nancy, one day and said, it's not fun anymore. And that was it. And, you know, he'd always told himself, the day it's not fun anymore is the day I walk away. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, he did, you know, he substituted for Paul Harvey for a couple of years, I think, after Paul retired. I remember that, yes. Yeah, and that was his life achievement award. I mean, the, going into the National Association of Broadcasters Hall of Fame, that's great. Yeah, he loved that. Uh, but there was, I mean, Jerry Jones and his wife flew out to Las Vegas just for that. You know, I mean, you know, Jerry and his wife are obviously busy people. Jerry got yes. his private plane and flew out there mm -hmm. to, to be a part of that celebration for Ron. So that's how much people thought about him. That's the effect he had on people. I mean, when you retire in Southwest Airlines, paint your name on one of its planes. Yes. You had an yes. You've had an big time. And one of the things yeah. Ron told me, and I mean, there's so many things, but I'll tell you this story. And actually, before Ron passed away a couple of years, uh, three or four years ago, I, I uh, actually got to sit down with him. And Sandy Hopkins had created this program called Dusty Addict. And the idea was we would have a guest, and that person would bring their favorite records and we play them and tell the story behind why each one was their favorite and so after sandy passed that story that show went away in the 1987 with sandy uh i resurrected it at caleb and i would have people in and one of the people i got to have in before he died was ron chapman and i went out to his house and i took my recorder and we talked about each song and how important mm -hmm. the phase of his life and that sort of thing then we play the record and that sort of thing <laughs> and uh, he told me that and, and this is a guy who used to tell me, if you die on Wednesday, you'll be forgotten by Friday. No one will care. You know, he was on one hand, he was very super uh, empathetic and sensitive yes. and, and warm hearted. And then on the other, there was a bit of cynicism in him because, you know, right. so many people wanted a piece of him. And, you know, we sat down and we were going through his records and we get to one. I see on your list you have Who Will Buy This Wonderful Morning by Barbara Streisand. Why is that one of your favorites? And he said, well, I was at an event a couple of years ago. And, I, you know, I'd, I told him when I'd left and gone to Caleb, man, you've got to start believing how much people love you. They don't all want something from you. They love you. You need to recognize that, feel good about it, because I think it was part of him that doubted it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, a couple of years after he left Caleb, you know, they went to the man or not mansion, they went to Fearings at the Ritz. And they went up to the door person there, and the young lady said, yes, you have a reservation? No. And they said, this is Ron Chapman. And the young lady looked at the list. He went, who? Oh, my God. I can't even imagine. You know, I mean, right. that was two years after he walked away. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he's telling a story about this woman who came up to him at an event and said, you saved my life, really, because the morning that President Reagan was shot, the morning after. Right. People were hurting and people were crying and this hadn't happened, you know, in a long time. And, you know, that was a time of great optimism for a lot of people and, you know, morning in America again and that sort of thing. And she started crying in front of Ron and she said, and what changed me was when you played Who Will Buy This Beautiful, This Wonderful Morning. And as she told this story, she started to cry. And as Ron's telling me this story, he's starting to cry. And I mean, he's literally choked up. I only saw him get really emotional three times. One, when Sandy died. Two, when Sidney Benton at CB, uh, Channel 8 died. She was the uh, executive secretary, knew everybody, really ran the place. And he loved her. She was the best. And then when I saw him tell this story, and, and 
so we played that song and you know here's a giant that i'd listened to since 1974 or five something like that but, you know my mentor my second dad uh my elijah uh, when he retired in caleb i said i just pray i get a sec a, a double portion of your spirit please yes and um you know at that point um he realized he realized how much people really loved him and boy that was good to see i mean that was that was a real good it's funny because um and not long after he died a big old cardinal landed in our backyard and the aussie looked at it and goes if that's wrong what do you suppose he signs you now and i said edit 20 percent you know because <laughs> um, that's what he always told me i mean i i we talk on the phone or i go see him i say i love you and he go edit 20 percent every damn time and um yeah, I mean, that, and I told his widow that later, and she loved it. She thought that was really fun. But when I asked her how she's doing, you know, kind of tells you where we're at in the industry. And without people like that, she said, I miss the laughter. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know? And that was the yeah. thing. The job at, Kayla, at KBIL, and what I tried to do at Caleb later, uh, was make sure that if you spent 15 minutes with us, you know, a quarter hour, uh, which, you know, you can't listen four minutes and get credit for it. you got to get them the whole 15 or 10 at least. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I said, if you give us 15 minutes, you'll go to work in a better mood. That was it, man. That was all, that was everything we did. Everything we did was based around that. We're going to give you the best of our ability for just a few minutes. And if you stay here, you're going to go to work in a better mood. That was it. That's all we did. And uh, that worked until somebody decided that the stock price mattered more. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Jody, you've interviewed hundreds of people. Um, two or three people stand out, your favorite interviews, your favorite celebrities, sports figures. Huh. Well, um, you know, it's funny. I've, I, yeah, I've met a lot of celebrities. Some, it's hard to say which ones don't jump out, you know, um, standing there talking to Johnny Cash, uh, you know, this right. wonderful warm smile with a splash of danger and the broadest shoulders I've ever seen. Um, Willie Nelson, um, you know, listening to that guy tell stories. Um, the best storyteller. I mean, not just one of the greatest singer songwriters in American history, but the funniest storyteller. And oh my God, he works blue. Anyway, um, but you can't help but laugh, right? You know, it's like, did I just hear that? It's some of the funniest stuff. He's written books with stories like that. They're just great. Right, um, right. Charlton Heston. Uh, I remember when we had this little singing group come by, their dad was driving them all over Texas. This was when I was doing TV at CBS 11. We had the show called Positively Texas. We'd have local guests, and if somebody was coming through writing a book or whatever, something like that, we'd have them on, you know, James Patterson or someone. Um, one of my dear friends who's gone now, Stephen J. Cannell, he was a brilliant man. Uh, he actually named one of his villains after me. If you read The Viking Funeral, Jody Dean is the bad guy. He named that after me. Uh, so there were lots of people like that, but the people that I remember most are the folks that you would not recognize their name. You'll probably never hear it. Uh, nice. They never the news. They never got, uh, but anyway, back to that story, I was telling you, this little band's driving all over Texas with these little teenage girls. Dad's driving the band, and they played our stage. They were called, I think, uh, Destiny's Child. Yeah. And I believe one of them has done rather well for herself. I think so, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sitting there with, you know, Kelly and, you know, all of them. And there's dad over there going, you know, just like a stage dad. And there's Beyonce, her first show in Fort Worth, Dallas. So, um, yeah, there were things like that. But, it, you know, people that I remember most are people at the food banks, people in the, you know, clothes drop off. Um, but, you know, I did a story one year about what back when they had toll booths on the tollway. I, I, would, I went and interviewed the toll taker because they had human beings in there that would take your money, right? And they were wonderfully well trained and they always had a greeting and always had a smile the people who worked the gates at the state fair of texas right, uh, right. they work hard to make you feel welcome and you know how do you i mean those people's names passed before us and gone but their effect on us is omnipresent it's daily and they touch our lives in ways that the movie star the rock star can only hope to attempt. And so, you know, I remember going to this church in South Dallas, they were collecting food. And it was really one of my first trips into South Dallas. 
And uh, this was probably about 1986, I guess. You know, I was a Fort Worth kid. I'd drive, come in, do my... But I didn't really take the time to know the town. But working at KVIL encouraged me to do that. So one year we did a story about local orchestras and choirs and things like that. We were going to incorporate it into our Christmas special. And, oh, here's the, you know, the, the chorus from First Baptist Church or whatever. And so this was True Love Missionary Baptist Church, South Dallas. And they were going to collect food one day. And... I walked in there, nobody's there yet, but volunteers haven't showed up. It's, it's not a great part of town. Uh, alone, I look like I'm probably coming to buy drugs or something worse, you know, I mean, it's not good. I'm driving a right. suburban, I, I'm in the wrong part of town, right? And so church is wide open, nobody there. I walked in and there's this one wonderful, just elegant lady with her apron and she's over the skillet and she's making fried bacon. And she doesn't even look up and she goes, are you hungry? And I thought, I just found a church, right? Yes. And yes. so, yeah, I, you know, you'll never hear her. I mean, I realized uh, when we did that that show that year, uh, or a few years later, actually, at KRLD, um, if you have a hearing-impaired child, where do you take your kid to see Santa? Right. That's a good there's an, yes. Yeah, there's an organization, or was then, I'm sure there are many more now, of signing Santas. And if you hear a child ask Santa for a bike, that's really cool. But if you watch a child ask Santa for a bike, that's better. And who knows their names? You know, I mean, I'm sure we can find it by Google now, but these are unsung heroes. I was part of a TV show for a while, and that was the name of the show, Unsung Hero. People that are out there making a difference every day, and you see it uh, all the time. And I, I, it's hard to remember this now, especially with our political climate, with the yes. division that's been sowed mm -hmm. in our country and the chaos. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and we all need to take some responsibility for this and figure out a way to, to work it out. Because when you have something like, say, those horrible wildfires up in the Texas Panhandle, people are sending trailers and they're sending grain and they're sending water and they're sending mm -hmm. whatever they can from all over the country. And not a yes. single one of them first asked, well, what political party do you belong to? Absolutely. Yes. What denomination are you part of? Uh, who did you vote for in the last election? The only question was, how can I help? And there's that basic right. thread that runs through us as human beings. And I think particularly um, among Americans, where we've gotten to the point where we will claw each other's eyes out right up until the flood. Right up until the plane crash. Nobody has to ask anybody to go to the blood bank. They just show up and nobody starts right. talking politics in line. So, right. you know, I think I think that, you know, having witnessed that and the and the people that you don't know that you I mean, why would you? They're just us. They're just us. They're not they're just us. And they have that as humble people. They, they typically don't want accolades. That's right. They are, they just have a thread of uncommon decency. Yeah, and absolutely. and I think that that means it may not be that uncommon. It just needs to be I don't know, appeal to, maybe. Maybe, you know, if we just reminded ourselves of who we can be, and that's what I used to say about advertising. you got two kinds. Inspirational, which is the kind that gets you up off your couch to go do something. And yes. aspirational, which asks you what kind of person you want to be. If you can achieve the second, the first is easy. That's why so many commercials now show not just the new Ram truck, but the Ram, Ram truck against the Rocky Mountains going through three feet of snow and all that. What kind of person do you want to be? Well, that kind of person drives the Ram or a Ford or a Chevy. That works. And uh, I watch political ads during campaign season. My heart breaks because yes. no one's asking us what kind of people do we want to be? Do we want to be the kind who lock doors and shut people out? Or do we want to be the ones who say, you're hurting. How can I help? Exactly. And I think that, that exactly. you know, nobody used to build a barn alone. Neighbors would come. They still do. Mm -hmm. They do. That's it. There's still that America, and there's there's still hope out there. It's kind of calloused over a little, and sometimes you have to. I remember my dad used to see you know he sorted mail for the post office on the railroad, and he'd come home and take a razor blade to that callus. And, you know, I've seen baseball pitchers do it. And I'm like, oh, man, well, but maybe we need a little feeling here. And, and also and also used to edit tape there at KVIL. And you used to have, you know, razor blade. And we'd, we'd edit the magnetic tape. And you'd, you'd have blood all over the place. So 
it was uh yeah uh boy i remember that seems so far away i mean Doesn't you can build it this is my home studio and i can do tv or audio in here video it doesn't make any difference but the crazy thing is is that i could i did quit this place with three trips to sam ash and maybe 500 bucks you know as well as i do to do a studio once upon a time 50 50 grand 100 grand oh, blue, blue blue, waiting that didn't happen anymore i mean why which is the other thing people you know say Oh, I want to get the radio and TV. I'll go, what's stopping you? That's right. It's, it's you know, the, there's your studio. Yeah. There's your studio. So I hope my phone's battery lasts long enough. I've got to go eat dinner too here in a few minutes. Oh, no time. problem. But yeah, I just wanted to uh, quickly ask a couple more questions of you, Jody, if you have a second. Uh, tell us about uh, your, your life now with a, with a tool belt and hammer in your hand and uh, the Chosen and Bass Reeves. Well, set building is getting to build toys for the, the, that other people play with. That's a pretty cool job. And it's really fun to sit at home and watch one of these shows and go, hey, we built that chimney or, hey, we built that swimming pool. Right. Uh, it, it helps the area. It's really good for Texas, and I love that. Um, I love the people I get to work with. I tell people that working in TV and radio for 50 years made me want to beat things with a hammer. And now I get to. So there's that. Um, it's funny. When I was younger, I'd been in a few films um just you know background and all that sort of thing uh logan's run eight seconds um pure country things like that uh honeysuckle rose and um right. i've done theater here and there damn yankees and any get your gun and music man and odd couple and stuff like that well my younger son is in the film business he's a lighting guy and he said dad you ought to have some fun here i think you'd really enjoy it and so why not so i thought about well if I wanted to work as a background or, you know, get some roles, how do I do that? Called up an agent and she just said, we're not interested in new people starting out. And I said, honey, I ain't new people. I'm an old people just coming back, you know? And I realized that the best way is any door that's open. So I remembered Harrison Ford got into the film business by doing set carpentry. And I thought, that's right. Yeah. And there, there was a guy that we grew up with named Burt Mustin, and Burt didn't start start acting until he was sixty-seven. He'd been oh, a yes. retail. That's right. He'd been a retail guy in Pittsburgh, and you know somebody saw him at a play and said, "Would you be in my movie?" I think it was William Wyler, and so he went on to do a movie. Between sixty-seven and his passing at ninety-two, he did one hundred and fifty films and TV shows. Leave it to Beaver, Mayberry, Andy Griffith, you name it. He was the old guy, right? He was the fire. Yeah, he was, in, he was in everything. Everything. Right. Everything. Yes. Wonderful yes. guy. And so I thought, well, why why not? You know, I mean, when you when you get to the end of a career that you've had for 50 years, you're confronted with two options. You could either wither or you could say, what now? You know, and so I'm not rich. I don't have a lot of money. I was an idiot with it, just like everybody else. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll probably die dead broke. I hope. I, you know, I'd like to think that I didn't didn't get the most out of it while I was here with the exception of my kids and the Aussie, but um, yeah, I, I don't care. So people ask me, okay, the barbecue rub, you want to make money? No, it sounds like fun. Making movies? Yeah, yeah. Sounds like fun. You know, building sets? Have you, have you, like been, to the, have you been to the uh, U.S. Marshals Museum in Fort Smith, Arkansas? Uh, the new, yeah, with the Bass Reeves exhibit. I, yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I've been out yeah. there, but I'm familiar with it. I've got a good friend who's a Bass Reeves reenactor and does schools and things like that. And I, that was right. part of the real joy of working on that show is however you feel about how it was dramatized, mm -hmm. that story needed to be told. It probably oh, needed to be told a few absolutely. more times. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really, really cool and you know, to have the art director and the you know producers all say, you know, it looked great. Well, that was our responsibility. And you know, we did some amazing things on that show and I thought it turned out really well. Same thing with The Chosen. Um, season four is in theaters still. And uh, although I'm not on screen, I, I was in season three, I'm not on screen in season four. A lot of what you see, I help build. Um, like the Grotto of Saint-Bon, which is the cave in southern France where Mary Magdalene allegedly, traditional, traditionally lived after the ascension. She moved to France, became a hermit. And so, you know, in the story, a couple of the disciples go to see her. And so we had to build this cave. And you can look it up online. It's amazing. It's in southern France, Saint-Bon near Montpellier. And so we built a smaller version of that in some studio soundstage right in uh, South Dallas. 
And uh, turns out, I didn't realize it at the time, but that's the ancestral home of my birth mother's family. So I'm kind of building a house for my hood. You know, I mean, little things wow. like that. You go, full circle. Right. What, right. How in the world did I wind up here? And ain't it yes. fun, you know? Well, tell us a little bit uh, about Jody Dean's Ranch Rub. Ah! How well, as briefly as, as briefly as I can, I spent okay. about half my life before I graduated high school in San Saba, Texas. And it's a cool little town. It's the con capital of the world and uh, nice people. And it's, you know, it's always been about 2,500 folks. The folks, it was bigger during the, you know, older days. Uh, it's something right out of No Country for Old Men. It's it's a Coen Brothers town, man. It's just got everything. Mm -hmm. We got, used to have boys who used to sit down, you know, old men sitting down whittling at the courthouse and all everybody in town, go see the boys, they're down there, you know, like that, right? Spitting and whittling. And uh, the Cactus Cafe and the Hotel San Steve. So this is a lot, the Armadillos High School mascot. And so this is a big part of me. And we knew the Reason family that discovered what became known as the Mother Pecan, which is the one tree from which Mr. Reason, E.E. E. Reason, bred all the soft-shell pecans we enjoy today. Mm. All those varieties came from that one tree, and it's still there. Parts of it are it's about 250, wow. 250 years old, yes. and it was insane. So all of this kind of played into it, working on my uncle's ranch, what we ate, how it was seasoned, the fact that I love chuck wagon cooking most of all. Cast iron chuck wagon cooking is like nothing else, man, nothing else. And so I wanted to kind of recreate, because I look at barbecue rubs, it's too salty, it's got weird stuff in it, salt sugar and you know it's just some of it like granulated whatever i don't even know what that is so i thought what would they have on a chuck wagon what would they have they didn't have much it was spices were expensive so what would they have well they'd have right. coffee they'd have salt they'd have some kind of pepper you could gather you know cayenne halfway along the trail you could probably find mexican hot peppers or sugar mexican sugar uh, so I combined about six or seven of those things into what I felt like was kind of the taste around the time that mother pecan was discovered about the time that my family settled in that part of Texas. Uh, you know, cause parts of my family go all the way back to 1802 in Texas. Yeah. And so it's just, it's a part of me and I wanted to do something that kind of paid homage to that. And most importantly to Stan Sabbath because it's a cool little place and I still love it very much. I don't get down there much, but you know, the Billiken family has a big worldwide shipping business and that is the family of EE e. Reason. So that's how far back they go. And it's just all this kind of stuff kind of played into it. And I thought, you know, if it could bring a little attention to the pecan capital of the world, that's just fine. So it's, it's out there now. You can order it from Suckle Busters. They have it in their mail order site. Or if you know somebody at a hardware store or a barbecue shop or something like that, you can just tell them, why don't you order this? If they carry supple busters, they can carry this and uh, they can get it. And uh, I'm probably going to hit a couple of the, uh, they, uh, there's a big cook off in Heiko coming up in May. That's always fun. The steak cook off uh, and yes. boy, there's great yeah. backyard chefs there. So, you know, just hand it out and see what happens. And if it works, it works. If people like it. That's great. If they don't, I do. And I do, I do tell people it's so good. It'll even make Tommy Lee Jones smile. <laughs> that's tough and, he, that's, that's and he'll probably sue me for that and that's okay that's okay do, that's free publicity well jody uh what what websites can we find you on podcasts etc where can we locate you know i have not uh, people keep telling me i need to do that maybe i will eventually i've got so many things going here i've got screenplay sure. that i'm working on i've got a new show that i'm working on um uh the people at medieval times called and said we are putting in a new show after six years and we haven't had a king it's all been centered around the princess but now we need or the queen now we need a king would you do it and i thought for about five seconds and i went sounds like fun right and i you know i didn't even think to ask what they pay and i was like why you know if it's fun doesn't matter what they pay you. if it's not we can't pay you enough so i thought and, and the other part of it was um you know i had to like I said, my voice is shot because this king is going to sound like Brian Blessed. You, <laughs> you know, Flash Gordon, right? And uh, just a wonderful uh, stage actor. Uh, lovely, lovely man. Um, but I also get to, I get free horseback tra training. So if I do an extra role or if I do some sort of Western thing for one of these other, and I've got another movie I'm filming here in May. Uh, but if I do anything and horseback riding is required, 
I'll know I'll have the skills again, you know. So there you go. that was that seemed like a double I get paid to go train for that's pretty cool. So I decided, why not, right? And I don't know how long I'll do it. They're what a great organization, that group. There's a reason they've been around for thirty something years. And it's like you hear the word troop, like a theatrical troop or a Shakespearean troop. Yes. That, that word is very rarely applies applied anymore. You hear cast, whatever. This is a troop. And everybody knows everybody else's part. The king or the knave, doesn't matter if there's trash on the floor, we pick it up. Why do you do it? Because when you look at the faces of the, that crowd, mostly kids, eight, nine, ten years old, who've grown up on every Disney princess and, you know, Beauty and the Beast and all of this sort of thing, and, and then the parents who watch uh, Game of Thrones, right? They all look like it's the most amazing thing. And you get to chew the scenery. I get to be as loud and as boisterous and as, you know, all of that. Um, That's a blast. Wow. It is, I mean, why not? Yeah. Do it for a while, you know, if you can't do it anymore, if you fall off the horse or whatever, we'll get there. But meanwhile, sounds like fun. Well, that's great, Jody. Such a blessing to have you on the show today. So so good seeing you and sharing all those great memories. I sure appreciate it. Well, you prove there is life out of, after radio, you know, and, uh, and, and this proves that I'm very close to the Medicare uh, and Social Security age, probably closer than I'm comfortable admitting. But yes. I'll probably be calling you in October. That's right. I'm licensed in Texas, so absolutely. And I am an idiot, so yes, I'll probably need your help. <laughs> and Jody, I'm going to definitely uh, get some of that uh, that wonderful uh, rub that you're offering there. So that you know, good. the other thing about it, let me give you a little advice. If you get it, it's Jody Dean's Stan Saba Ranch Rub. Okay. Or beef. I'm working on one for pork and chicken, you know, some sort of Gulf Coast seafood thing that I've got in my head. Somehow, if I can get Jimmy Buffett in a bottle, you know, uh, there you go, right? And so it's got to have lime in it and uh, maybe a little salt. So, but um, I will say this: one of the things I noticed about a lot of barbecue rubs and a lot of recipes, you cake it on. You just, you know, you just pound it on, and you want that bark. It's really not the thickness of the rub that gives you the bark. It's wrapping usually something like butcher paper that gives you the bark because it causes the top layer of the meat to crust up. It's not mm -hmm. it's not the seasoning. Right. It's holding in the temperature while releasing some of the moisture, right? I thought that's such a waste. Why get a bottle of rub if you're gonna have to use it twice and you're out? So I purposely made this, it's got a little punch. I love Mexican, the the southwestern introduction of Mexican flavors into Texas barbecue. You you find it a lot now. It's really good. It's not too spicy. You don't want that, but you also don't have to use tons of this stuff. I, I tell people, if you get it, go slow. See where your zone is. You may not like coffee. You may not want to use so much because coffee gives it that rich cocoa taste, right? Yes. After smoke. It's really a unique thing. And I thought, if I was a chuck wagon cook in 1890, given what I would have on my wagon, how much would it, I mean, what would I have? And how much would I have to use? Because I don't want to be blowing salt. And nothing against these other spectacular you know spices out there seasonings but if you see these i mean it's like holy mackerel that requires a lot i didn't want that now can you do a cross promotion while you're on horseback at the renaissance festival and then just throw uh throw some of the bottles out there to the crowd or oh it's going to be that? like an old spice commercial there's going to be you know <laughs> right, right right yeah it's going to be a you know half man half horse riding around i only barbecue with you know right i don't know uh, i i i don't know i mean we'll just see i'm going to take it to some of these festivals and i've sent it to some of my old buddies from high school and they're using it and you know i'm coming around like this waiting for them to tell me whether they like it my son who is an absolute barbecue snob lives in denver with his wife and two kids he said he was going to use it this weekend so i've you know but it is what it is. It's what I like. I had one wonderful chef who said it's too spicy. And I said, well, if you use it like you use any other rub, yeah, maybe. Right. Don't. Mm -hmm. Don't. You know, a little should go a long way. Well, Jody, I better let you get to dinner here. So uh, what, what do you have? You to have no spice? idea how this conversation has made me hungry. Yes. Oh, me too. I, I mean, uh, I live downwind from a barbecue joint. <laughs> you couldn't I mean, it, it, for a Texan. Dude, I've gotten to work on a cowboy show, a Jesus show, and I live three blocks from a barbecue joint. This is heaven. 
This is it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's for me. That's the heart of Texas there. That's I can't right. beat that. Cowboys, Jesus, and barbecue. I'm good. <laughs> well, that's great. You have a great night, Jody. So Thank good you. seeing you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Come see us no a problem. couple times. All right. Sounds good. You take yeah. care. Have a, great, have a great night. Thanks for watching the Medicare Funcast with Brian Coolis. Make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. It's been fun. We'll see you next time.